This is a self-organizing map. Intricate, fractal-like webs appear when it's generated in a certain way. In this video, we're going to explore how and why these patterns form. But first, what is a self-organizing map? A self-organizing map, or song, is primarily a data visualization tool that can help make sense of large, high-dimensional datasets by grouping data samples into clusters in two-dimensional space. Let's use the classic IRIS dataset as an example. The IRIS dataset is a collection of 50 samples from each of three species of iris flowers, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Each sample contains four numbers, which are measurements of the flower's petal length, petal width, sepal length, and sepal width, and is labeled with which iris species it belongs to. Training a SOM involves giving it data samples with no labels and updating points on the map, called nodes. This is known as unsupervised learning because there are no labels used during training. I'll go over the training algorithm in more detail later, but right now I just want to describe the big picture. Here's what the SOM looks like after training it on the IRIS dataset. You can see one distinct division forming two groups in the map. The other division is much less prominent, but if we overlay the IRIS data samples onto the SOM, and color them according to their labels, we can see the different species are clustered into different spatial regions of the map. If we had another sample where the species was unknown, we could also use this trained map to classify it based on which region it fell into. So that's a quick intro to the SOM, and now we can move on to the more interesting stuff. In a 2015 paper published in the International Conference on Natural Computation, Roy Wong discovered mysterious emergent patterns in the SOM network when it was trained on colors. The algorithm used to train these SOMs is as follows. In general, each training sample is an n-dimensional vector, but here, there are three-dimensional vectors representing the red, green, and blue intensities of the color. We can stack a bunch of these training samples together to form a matrix and make the training data evenly span the entire color spectrum. Next is the map for the output nodes of the SOM. Each output node has a weight vector, which defines the mapping from the input to that node's output. In general, each weight is also an n-dimensional vector the same dimension as the input training sample for a fully connected network. So here, the weights are three dimensions as well, and thus also represent a color. The weights of the output nodes of the SOM are randomly initialized to start. The training process is iterative. On each iteration, the training sample is chosen at random and the activation of every node is calculated. The node with the highest activation becomes the winning node. This is basically the node whose weight color is most similar to the input color. During this learning process, the amount of learning each node does follows a Gaussian function, where nodes closer to the winning node learn more than those farther away. In the equation, d is the distance of a node from the winning node. Sigma controls the width of the Gaussian function, and eta is the learning rate, which has a value between 0 and 1. When a node's weights are updated, they become more similar to the input, so that they will respond better to similar samples in the future. The eta and sigma values are updated to decay exponentially from their initial values on each iteration. The process is repeated until the SOM reaches a steady state. As the training progresses, different regions of the SOM learn to respond to different colors. The 
Then, after the training is done, each input sample is passed to the SOM again, and the winning node for each input training sample is displayed with its color. The rest of the nodes are turned black. The SOM for this animation is too small for any patterns to emerge, but larger SOMs show the web-like patterns. By varying parameters of the algorithm, like the number of training samples and the initial width of the Gaussian function, the patterns change. Increasing sigma tends to create more organized hierarchical patterns, while decreasing it tends to create more disjointed patterns. Varying the number of training samples also exposes different sections of the patterns. To my knowledge, the underlying mechanisms for how these patterns develop is still mostly unknown, but I'll summarize my understanding of the preliminary explanation provided by Wong in his paper. Suppose that sometime in the middle of training, node A best represents training sample A, node B best represents sample B, and node C best represents sample C. Node B is closer to node A than node C. Then, let's say that sample A randomly gets chosen for this iteration. When the weights are updated, nodes B and C may not best represent samples B and C anymore. Now, they might be best represented by these two nodes. Notice that the new best matching node for training sample B moved farther away from the original best matching node than did the new best matching node for node C move from the original best matching node for node C. This is because the Gaussian function acted more strongly on node B than node C because it's closer to node A. The result of this process is that after each iteration, winning nodes tend to be pushed to more similar distances from each other than before the iteration. This has the effect of making the winning nodes lie on a line, and since nodes adjacent to that line will not be winning nodes, a black strip will appear around the line. But that's just a basic qualitative explanation. It's still very much an open question as to how these intricate patterns form. It's also not clear if this property of the SOM network has any practical applications. There aren't any that I know of, but there could be some that are yet to be discovered. Regardless, studying this phenomenon has been fascinating because it's an example of unexpected beauty that's still shrouded in mystery.